I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. When you started Blackstone, um, you were 38 years old. You'd already made wealth being one of the highest ranking managers at Lehman Brothers. What drove you to say, ah, I could do whatever I want for the rest of my life, but I think I'm going to work 100 hours a week instead and also do the rest of what I want for the rest of my life? Yeah, well, you know, um, I, I don't regard it as work. I regard it as an adventure. And memos I get on situations at work, I don't look at them as work. I, I look at them as short stories. And I get to play a part in the story. I, I can help write the story. That's fascinating. So, so I don't feel put upon with the normal concept of work. I mean, it's really fascinating. Can you imagine a life where you spend your time learning new things all the time? How do you, of people listening to this, maybe they've been driving back and forth to the same job for, for 20 years, you know, with a simmering frustration that they never pursue their dreams. How does someone find their dream? All right, so we've got an extremely impressive guy in the studio, Steve Schwartzman, chairman, CEO, co-founder of Blackstone, which is the biggest, I'll call it a private equity fund, but it's really the biggest money. It's, it's, it's basically the most influential and one of the biggest managers of money on the planet. You guys, you, you have $474 billion under assets, that's a lot of money, almost half a trillion dollars. You're like you're like five countries all rolled up into one. You own half the world practically. Like, what are some of the companies you own or own parts of? Well, we 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 we, we used to own Hilton. Uh, we you took owned, that public. Right, we took took that uh, uh, public. We uh, own a company uh, that's called Refinitiv, but was Thomson Reuters. Uh, so uh, we just sold that. We bought it for twenty billion dollars. We uh, sold it uh, to the London Stock Exchange, uh, and uh, assuming that goes through antitrust and uh, uh, the, uh, Europe, uh, we'll be the largest shareholders in the London Stock Exchange. Um, we, we're the largest owners of real estate in the world. Um, 
is sort of a funny thing to say, but because yeah, we started uh, both, both we, homes and commercial properties, your innovation yes, homes was yeah. was brilliant. Right. So so it's all, all kinds of real estate all around uh, the world, uh, as well as uh, uh, companies were the largest investors in hedge funds uh, in the world. Um, and we're one of the largest extenders of um, of credit and into leverage situations. So let's can I ask you about that for a second? And sure. this is more for the audience just to understand. Like um, typically, when we think of debt, the first reaction is "oof, debt," uh, and the second reaction might be, "Well, the government has a lot of debt," and then the third reaction might be. Well, okay, debt, because when I buy my house, I borrow from the bank. Right. And everybody thinks that's normal, and every other instance of debt is not normal. But when I describe what you do to people, it makes so much more sense than a bank lending a homeowner money for debt. Even though that makes sense, too, that's a usually a safe bet for a bank, what you do is like that, except the thing that you're buying, a company, actually gives you back cash in return as opposed to a right. home that someone lives in. Right. Yeah, well, what we do is, uh, in the private equity part of our business, we, we buy companies. And uh, we have about uh, 500,000 uh, people uh, who work at our companies. And, and apparently, you know, that's the second largest employer in the country after Walmart. Uh, and... So, so we own probably as many as 200 uh, companies. But before we buy one, uh, we have to have a plan to make it better uh, because we, we don't make any money if it doesn't get better because uh, we've paid to buy it and usually we've paid a high price to buy something. So, so there's always a plan to have it grow faster uh, and make more profits. When... Uh, a, a company grows faster, uh, it needs more investment, and it also needs to hire more people. Uh, and, and so what happens with what we do is we improve it. Our companies tend to grow about 50% faster than the average companies. We enhance... Well, why do you think that is? Oh, I know why that is. Uh, because we, 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 we study businesses before we buy them. It's not like buying a stock on a stock exchange. Uh, we get all of the uh, data on the company. We can meet with the management. And, and sometimes the management has ways of improving the company they won't do. Because if you're a public company, sometimes that slows down your growth and your stock goes down. But, but, but it enables the company to grow a lot faster further out in the future. And sometimes they don't make those investments. And, and with us, if the company is private, we will make those investments cheerfully. We won't care so much what the profits are in the short term. And, and you know, we, we, we recruit uh, people who are to manage uh, the company who are sometimes better than the people who are there. Uh, and it's all geared to growing fast creating uh, a better organization, hiring more people, and we enhance the return by putting some debt on the company. So it's interesting. You would think that was risky. Uh, what happened through the global financial crisis is this style of investing um, basically had no more bad outcomes than the average company that didn't have that amount of, of, of debt on it. Uh, it was quite interesting. One way you protect the company when you do that is is you have the maturities very, very far out. So it's like a mortgage where you don't pay down principal. Uh, and, you know, almost anybody can make their, their interest payments. Not everybody, if you have excess and bad regulation. During the crisis, some people couldn't. But for almost my entire life, people don't default on their homes. Uh, that was just a very unusual time in history. So, so, so we, we, we shock test every, every uh, business we buy, uh, and we look at the worst downturns, like the global financial crisis, and we'll never put more debt on a company than you could easily service during the financial crisis. So, so as a result of these types of things, um, uh, our, our profits from those types of uh, activities are about double uh, the profits of, a, of an investor in the stock market in an index. So if you make double the profit, um, 
you, you become very popular uh, for the peop- from the people who give you money. So who gives us money? Well, we get money from large pension funds. Uh, about a third of it is, is from you know, public pension funds. It's firemen, uh, uh, policemen, uh, government uh, workers, teachers, and uh, we have a huge share of that business. So, so when we make more money than the average, they get the benefits. So the people who are getting the benefits are regular people for their retirement. They don't get to see it because somebody's choosing those investments for them. Uh, but, but if their pension funds aren't funded and, and their future's secure, then something really bad you know, will happen to their lives. So, so we're contributing to that. We're, we're contributing you know, to, to um, uh, employment. We, we've created about 100,000 jobs. Uh, and, and it's a really positive sums game. Uh, and it's a, it's a great thing to be doing uh, because there are winners everywhere. Uh, right. So, the, so the, uh, the business you buy wins because it grows. The potential employees who are future hired by the business benefit. The community where that business is benefits your investors, which trickle down to the you know, teachers in the California Teachers Fund right. or whatever they benefit. Um, but you, you said a co- many things, actually, that were interesting that I want to unpack a little. Uh, first is this implication that you, where does your money come from? My guess is when you start a new fund or raise new business, your best new customers are your old customers. That's absolutely right. So you start a business, no matter who starts, whatever it is, whether it's a green grocer, you got to have some customers. And if they talk to their friends, if you have, you know, sort of good melons, uh, you'll get more business. Uh, and ours, ours is the same. Uh, and that's why it's important that everything we do has to be very successful because to a certain degree, it's a referral business. We help that by going out on and, and, and calling on those new potential investors, but they're always interested in how did things work. And, and, and so that's why we are very uh, risk averse uh, as a company, uh, as a firm, because you never want to have anybody, <clears throat> excuse me, give, give a bad recommendation. Right. And so, I mean, you mentioned uh, throughout the book and one of your 25 rules for life, which by the, for work and life, which by the way, if you read anything, read that. If you read anything in any book, read that one chapter and hang it up on your wall, which is what I'm going to do. And I'm not saying this, sorry if that sounds obsequious. It's true. These statements are really powerful and we'll talk about them later. But I want to, I want to also unpack a couple of things about your description of what you do. Uh, you, you, because these companies are not public stocks that you mostly invest in almost a hundred percent of the time, you don't have to worry about quarter by quarter. Oh my gosh, if I say the wrong word, the stock's going to fall 20%. Everyone's going to hate me. The board's going to fire me. I'm going to feel like a failure. You could, as you mentioned to the, the Chinese premier, you're planting seeds and uh, watching them. You have time to watch them grow. And I think that's, that's what separates out a private fund by investing in private businesses from like a mutual fund or an investor who invests in stocks and is like constantly refreshing Yahoo Finance. You know, there's nothing for you to refresh. You have to actually go into the guts of the business and see, is this working in reality, not just a stock going up and down? Yeah, you've got it. Our business, our business is to make these things work. And, um, you know, that's, that's where the, uh, the extra return, if you will, comes from. And we're very patient. Uh, you know, I don't care, uh, whether something could be done in three years or five years, as long as it's done. And, you know, we took a company like Hilton, um, and I think we got close to doubling its number of rooms. Uh, Hilton's now, uh, got an award, uh, of, um, best place to work in the United States. And when we took that company over, that wasn't the case. And it was the most profitable, uh, you know, investment ever ever made in the private equity business, not by us, by anybody. I think we made somewhere between 12 and $14 billion of profit. Uh, but the way you do that isn't by setting out to make profit. You have to make something better. Right, you can't uh, just love hotels and then want to buy Hilton because right. that might be 
You're not using any kind of criteria for, for right. what makes this a good investment. Right. So we, we, we figured out how to make that a much better uh, company, and, and that happened. But it's not just that you made it a better company. When you were breaking down the deal in the book, and by the way, you don't do a lot of deal breaking down. This book is not in the weeds. It's very interesting to see the arc of your success and how you did it and, and what you've learned. But Hilton is a great example of you being what you described as risk averse. Like you analyze, because you get all the information, you analyze first, how do we avoid losing money? And what you identified, it looked like to me, out of their, I don't know how many thousands of hotels they have, but you identified six or seven of the most premier hotels, including the Waldorf Astoria, and said, oh, if I just have these seven hotels and sell them or do something with them, that's half the value of the deal. And then I've got another 10,000 hotels to, to work with. Yeah, well, we try and find some sensible way uh, to win. Uh, you know, um, uh, that's, that's ethical and um, reduces risk or gives us more money to grow faster w within the company somewhere else. Um, it's actually a lot of fun. What, why, so, so in that case, though, you know, finding an opportunity like that where a small piece of the company can almost pay for the entire deal, that would seem to be relatively rare. You have to find special situations. Like in this case, the CEO... He wanted. He was getting older. He wanted to retire. You were friends. He he wanted to sell the business. He sold to you. Why didn't he just take those seven hotels, sell them, have the stock price go much higher, and then sell? Well, it's interesting. Um, there, there 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 is a certain um, lethargy uh, that sometimes sets in. Uh, there's there's sometimes a different incentive structure, uh, and sometimes when you do things. Uh, that are different, there's risk, uh, and, and it might not work out so well. So not necessarily in this case, but more generally, uh, people all often are risk averse. Uh, and um, we, we think we are too, but we're so used to doing things. We, we have a really great idea of how they're gonna turn out or else we don't go forward. Some people, when they're not sure, don't move. Uh, and, and so that creates um, uh, so, sort of sometimes there's fresh eyes uh, on a situation that allow you to see things that maybe somebody else doesn't have that experience. It, it seems like um, perception is just as much part of business as reality. And, and, and that plays a role in a lot of your decisions. And I'm going to, I want to dive into that a little further, but in, in this one case, let's take Hilton maybe Hilton was afraid to sell the wall of Astoria because that was such a gem for Conrad Hilton, you know, uh, decades ago. And the CEO of Hilton maybe just didn't want to cloud public perception of his company by selling off their, their prized jewel. But when you took it private, you don't need to think about that. Right. And, um, you try and think about things that will help the business, uh, and are sensible. Uh, and, and you try to just look at things objectively. Uh, and it's very hard to be objective. Uh, you know, if you were raised uh, at, at Hilton doing something like selling the Waldorf, it, it would be like uh, a sin. You know, a sin. Uh, it's going to say apostasy. Uh, and, and, you know, it, 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 w it wouldn't get, you know, sort of a normal kind of a hearing. Right, which, which, so I'm not saying he made a bad decision. He made the decision maybe even best for his stock price, which was his eventual price he sold well, the, the company to you. So he, he was aware he could sell it, but he just, he, he didn't want to deal with the short-term ramifications of everyone being disappointed. Well, it, it, you know, he, he, overall, they, they got a very good price at the time selling it to us. Um, nobody else would have paid that price, but, but, Nobody else would have looked at the business and recognized that's not quite true. No one else, there were one or two people in the world uh, would have um, that that you know we could expand it so much faster because they they had stopped expanding internationally and the company had a great name, huge brand name recognition, but they hadn't opened a new hotel uh, outside the United States for. I think it was either 20 years or 25 years. And Why do you think? Because uh, they split the company in half, and the foreign part was a separate company controlled by other people. 
uh, it, it had its own public uh, listing in London. And for some reason, they never wanted to expand. And they, uh, right before we bought the whole thing, they put that foreign business back together. And we looked at it and said, geez, there's so much international growth. We, 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 we could just open a huge number of, of hotels that people wanted. Uh, and we even could get them to put up the money and we could manage them so we were making, you know, like huge um, uh, rate of return on those. It required no capital, and and we got paid most of the profits. So so this is a good structure uh, to use. It completely reinvigorated the brand. Uh, and you know, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about Hilton, but I know this but, but this, one, this, th- Hilton. this one was sort of easy. But but it's a good it's a good example of a what you do, how you reduce risk how you then take a company and uh, expand it. So it's two things. One is on the reducing risk, you could potentially sell or, or value correctly the properties you have. And then the second is where can we expand that for whatever reason, doesn't matter what, the company was not expanding. And in those two ways, you bring up the value, just like when a house doubles in value, a homeowner makes maybe five to 10 times as money because they're using leverage that it enhances your returns. What, what would you say, you know, I've, I forgot to mention two things in the intro. One is you're an incredibly successful investor. What would you say is the average return, if you can figure it out, of your funds, your main fund, whatever? Yeah, yeah. Our, our, our fund um, in the high performance area like I'm talking about, um, you know, would, would, would earn after fees somewhere around uh, 17% uh, every year. Right, which is phenomenal, as everybody knows. Yeah. And... Um, you know, the other thing I forgot to mention is how much you've been involved over the past several decades, particularly in the past two decades, in behind the scenes public policy. Like in the financial crisis, you were on the phone with Hank Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury, and even Barack Obama in terms of how they kind of both solve the financial crisis and then have a soft landing from a public perception point of view of how to how to deal with issues like the bailout and and, and so on. And then even with uh, you know, President Trump, you've you've been involved in giving advice. You also give a lot to charity. I want to discuss some of that. Um, but reeling it back to the beginning, your your dad had a store, and you were always pushing him. Dad, why don't you expand? It would be so easy. And he's like, oh, "I'm I'm fine. This is good. I have a good life." Are you complaining? And and he was right too. But what do you think gives you? This when you when you started Blackstone, um, you were 38 years old. You had already made wealth uh, as being one of the highest ranking managers at Lehman Brothers. Uh, what drove you to say, "Ah, I could do whatever I want for the rest of my life," but I think I'm going to work 100 hours a week instead and also do the rest what I want for the rest of my life? Yeah, well, you know, um, I I don't regard it as work. I regard it as an adventure, uh, and, um, you know, uh, memos I get on situations at work, I don't look at them as work. I, I look at them as short stories, uh, and I get to play a part in this story. Uh, I can help write this story. Uh, That's fascinating. So, so, so I don't feel uh, put upon uh, with a normal concept uh, of work. I mean, it's really uh, fascinating. Uh, to, can you imagine a, a life where, where you, you spend your time learning new things uh, all the time, and and you can ask anybody who's involved with them, uh, who will know more than yourself, uh, you know about how, how does this work? What what can we learn here? And you know we we formed an amazing team of people at uh, Blackstone, uh, and everybody is so smart. I am the least smart person. Uh, at the firm now. Now I, we're now. I we're, doubt it. People say that, but go ahead. No, 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 no. This I, I can almost prove it. Uh, and you know, we, we we hire all these Magnus and Sumas, and and you know, I wasn't Magnus Suma or even Cum Laude uh, when I graduated. And and so the opportunity to be with people who are smart, prepared, doing new things all over the world. Um, uh, in, in, in different asset classes. And so, and so you learn constantly about everything and then you interweave 
you know, uh, the politics that, that needs to happen in all these different places. So you understand what's going on. Uh, this is so fascinating that, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's addictive. Uh, and, you know, forget that the decisions could be scary, but you get, you get used to, you know, sort of committing huge amounts of capital. Actually, we have, you know, since you read that draft of the book, we now have 545 billion instead of 480 billion. So we got over your, you know, sort of half, half a trillion, trillion uh, you know, half a, a, a half a billion, a half a trillion mark. The, 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 these are these are billions we have, not yeah. not you know, hundreds of millions. So so I, I find all of these things uh, fascinating. Plus, they're great tests. Of, of of your ability to do well. In other words, uh, make pretend you're a basketball player. Uh, you, you, sometimes you get paid a lot of money to play basketball. Uh, this is sometimes you just like going on a court. You like playing basketball, and you, you'll do it for big money. You'll do it for no money. You just like to play because you like the feeling uh, of of trying to you know, get around somebody who's guarding you, put the ball up and just have it go in the basket, watch the arc and have that sound when it goes through the net. Whoosh. It's really fun. And so I look at the things I do uh, very much like that. Every person I meet uh, is an adventure. They're all different. I guess when you get, I mean, thinking about it in terms of storytelling, when you get, let's say, a deal memo for the first time, like, oh, Steve, here's an opportunity, it is almost like the classic arc of the hero. You're getting an opportunity to go from your ordinary world to the extraordinary world where you own this company, and now you're confronted with a set of problems, you meet new people to help those problems, the problems get bigger and bigger until the final problem, which is creating and exiting value out of the company, and then you return to use your new knowledge for the next story. Yeah, that's, I, I hadn't looked at you know, this as a heroic enterprise, but, but you know, that is what it is. And as you were speaking, I realize I have um, a huge number of them going on simultaneously. And so um, you, you can always like uh, switch channels, uh, switch the channel in your mind and as soon as you switch, it's like a real channel switch, right? You, you, you get a different program. How interesting is that? Right. No commercials. So, so now it, you can say this, not at the end of your career, obviously, but in hindsight, since, since the 80s when you started the firm, uh, when you were first starting, it was brutal. You had to raise money. You were going to meetings, like you're, you described the meeting with Delta in Atlanta, where they were like, hey, nice to see you. We're not going to invest, but nice to meet you. And you had to, you and Pete Peterson had to fly over there and then fly back, and he threatened to kill you if you ever do that to him again. Uh, it wasn't pleasant in the beginning. And then you had, you, you people learn lessons often from hard experiences. You had that initial, perhaps the worst investment you made, which was Edgecombe. Uh, it was, these are brutal experiences that nobody wants to go through. Yeah, I don't blame them. Uh, these are horrible uh, experiences. And, and one of the things um, that's quite popular now is, is becoming an entrepreneur because people have some vision that you announce you're an entrepreneur and somehow, you know, like in, uh, you know, six months, you're, you're magically uh, enormously successful and affluent, and uh, you take a victory lap. Uh, that's that's not the way it works, right? That's the way it works every once in a God knows how many. But real people, that's not how it works. Like in that beginning time, did you ever feel like give saying, "Ugh, this is not worth it. I don't want people to think I'm a failure. I'll just try the next thing when it comes along." Well, I I knew what we were headed towards was a good thing but getting there was um was so difficult and one of the things one one of the lessons uh, in the book is is you have to be prepared for enormous psychic pain uh to become successful how do you deal with that you you it's 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 like being an athlete in training i mean i i, I was a track athlete 
and you you train before the meets and and the the way you train is you overtrain so so you'll, you'll you'll run more than you run in a meet you'll run with more frequency and if you if you're going to run one race uh in practice you run three uh, uh if and, and you won't just run the same distance sometimes you'll run double or triple or quadruple the distance so you basically train yourself to to one have more stamina than you'll need when you perform but 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 also the the idea of going through in effect uh, they describe that for marathons the wall of pain um you just keep going and um if you're you you have to be prepared for that loneliness uh for the isolation for the psychic pain uh because the world doesn't fall into line because you want to do something uh, you know uh, if you're selling anything new somebody's already using something old they like it more or less so getting people to change because people don't often like changing we say we do but they actually like familiar things for the most part not 100 percent, but for the most part so if your proposition is you've got something new, you're making somebody change, you're already at a disadvantage. Uh, and when you start, you, you are delusional. Uh, you, you think because you're doing it, it's great. Everybody should hop on board. And when they don't, you better quickly figure out that to get there, maybe you need to do it a little different way. But, but what you have to have is enormous tenacity. And you, you never can give up. And it seems like self-forgiveness as well, because let's say, I mean, along the way you did make some bad decisions. Later on, there were some decisions you made that could have turned out enormously bad. Uh, it seems like to have that tenacity, you have to also be able to forgive yourself to basically move on. Were you able to do that in well, critical it's, it's, points? It's, it, I don't, I don't, you know, look at that in a in a um, religious context of forgiveness. I look at it as learning. Mm -hmm. So so if you do something that didn't work out the way you say, you know, that's that's you know, retrospectively, that's a great moment. Uh, be, because we, we don't learn from our successes, we just continue to do them. But when you really mess something up, uh, you, you, you know, most people try and make pretend it didn't happen or forget about it. I never forget about it. And the reason is there are lessons to be learned. What did I miss? What did we miss? What's wrong with our process that, that, that allowed us to miss something that we should have seen? Let's fix it. So, so you have to look at every situation when it doesn't work the way you thought and say, what's, what's wrong with my paradigm, my thought paradigm or my process or our people or, um, you know, sort of what did we miss in the world? Where, where was the inappropriate emphasis we placed on something so we can fix it for the future? So, so in a way, uh, you, you never forgive yourself, um, but, but, but you learn. And, and that's why when you get older, actually, hard to imagine, life is more fun uh, than when you're younger. I always thought I was at maximum, you know, sort of fun. Uh, probably at 34. That's about when I was the smartest, I believed. Four years before you started this company? Yeah. I mean, you know, 34-year-olds are always totally self-confident and, you know, sort of uh, I was. And, and, and by the time I logged in another 10 to 15 years, I, I realized, oh, my God, uh, how could I have thought that? Look at the mistakes I've made, and we fixed those up. So now we're at the point... Uh, um, you know, our, our business is 34 years old and, uh, I, I'm actually older than that, uh, that, you know, I've profited by learning things and there's still weird stuff. Oh my gosh. I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine. That's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes. I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half. And I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, 
packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main dot com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Like you, 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 you underline the importance of tenacity, but when should someone give up? on a business or a dream or, or well, a project? So the most important thing is to have the right dream. Achieving it is a mechanic. Having the right thing you're pursuing uh, is really, that, that's really somewhere around 70% of the whole thing. How do you, of people listening to this, maybe they've been driving back and forth to the same job for, for 20 years, you know, with a simmering frustration that they never pursue their dreams. How does, how does someone find their dream? Well, first you have to think about what a dream would be. 
you know, you, you can have a dream right where you are. And, you know, whatever you're doing or your organization's doing, nonprofit or profit, and, and you go, geez, I wonder if we could do this a lot better. And what, would, what do I think we should do differently to achieve something that's, that's better than where we are now? So, so, you know, everyone can do that. You don't have to leave. And, and you go to, you know, people senior to you, uh, or if you're in charge, you know, you convene a group of people to test your idea and say, we're doing X today, but, but geez, if we set a different objective and, and took our people or some percentage of them and pursued this other dream, in addition to what we're doing, wouldn't this be more interesting? Wouldn't we do better? So that, that's interesting though, which is A, finding the dream that you're excited about, but also part of a, what you've kind of like collapsed into the concept of dream is what's your vision of doing it differently? That seems to be just as much a part of the dream as anything else. Well, sometimes, you know, it overlaps with the dream, but sometimes, you know, um, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, in the financial uh, recession in 1990-92, um, all of a sudden, you know, real estate really collapsed. Uh, the government basically took over bankrupt savings and loans. There were no real estate transactions that occurred. The system was frozen and somebody brought us uh, an opportunity. And so, so, so I didn't know anything about it. Uh, in real estate, I owned a co-op in New York. That was it. Um, and the, this was a bunch of um, uh, garden apartments in Little Rock, Arkansas, and East Texas. Um, neither location I had ever been to. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, there was very little competition for these. It was a second auction that the government had. I think there were two bidders. We were one. Um, and I priced it in a way that I thought would be very advantageous because there was virtually almost total illiquidity in the United States. And we won the deal and we got a 16% yield uh, on the deal. Because uh, they were rental properties. There were rental properties that we set up and the properties were 20% uh, vacant. And, and so I figured when, you know, just to start out, if we had 16% with no leverage and I borrowed some money like a mortgage on a house, then I'd make 23% a year forever, more or less. Pretty good. Uh, and then when the economy would recover, then uh, that 23% would go up to around 45% if we filled up those vacant units. So I said, geez, 45% forever. This is like really good stuff. And then I realized that if the economy continued to improve, you could then increase the rent. And so I figured I was buying some, some units well below what they cost to make, and I could end up making 55%. A year, not even accounting the fact that the value of the properties are going up. Yeah, leave that aside. Uh, this is just on cash flow. Uh, and so I, I ended up being wrong. Uh, we we made 64%. But who would what know? A, Steve, why do you but, make such mistakes? I can't, right, why right. do people tolerate you? <laughs> well, we try. So, But the, the reason I told this story uh, is about dreams. So we bought this, and I said to the person who who brought the deal to us, um, I said, how much more real estate is there like this in the United States that could be bought? And he said, a whole country full. And I sat there and I said, we should buy everything that we can because this is such a moment you can't miss. So then the problem became, you know, can we get people who are expert at doing that? Could we raise huge amounts of money to do that? And would things recover slow enough so that we had it to, uh, the time to put those things in place? But, but the dream was owning as much as you could because you couldn't 
miss. Right. So, so, so the dream is not just, oh, I want to buy some properties I could rent out. The dream was I want to buy properties because A, no one else is here and you have as one of your rules for work uh, and life, go where no one else is. But often that implies a lot of risk, but you were able to B, take out the risk and C, see that with any kind of normal historical growth, this becomes a huge opportunity. And even without growth, it's an opportunity. Yeah. And so, it's, and then you expanded the vision to say, let's own the planet. Yes. And, you know, that's a little hyperbolic, but still. Thank the, you. The base, basic, <laughs> that was the basic thrust of it. And, 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 and now we're the largest owner of real estate in the world. But, but, but I, I want to add to that because there's the other example right after the financial crisis of 2000, 2000, 2008, 2009, professionals weren't buying, uh, individual, you know, homeowner, residential real estate, uh, for a variety of reasons that market had collapsed. Banks were still not lending and, and you went in and even though you're this hundred billion dollar fund at the time, you start off buying a hundred thousand dollar property. So it seems like another uh, way of entering into a dream is to experiment because you're not going to buy a, a $10 billion property as your first foray into a dream. You're going to buy it one, one hundredth of 1% of what you could do. You're going to experiment with this opportunity. Well, that, that's actually not true. I, I would have bought $10 billion <laughs> if I could have, but there was nothing for sale because all these houses are individually owned. And, and, and so what, what happened is the government made a huge mistake, um, uh, in regulation, which is, you know, I don't know why people don't look at the financial crisis and say, it couldn't have just been these stupid banks. There must have been somebody regulating them. Okay, so they were completely incorrectly regulated. So what happened with housing is, is they let, uh, before the collapse, they had very small down payments. So you could put up 4% uh, equity and borrow 25 times your money and you had a house. Right, and now, uh, now, just as an example, you have to put down 20 or 30%. Right, so what happened after this crisis? So, so, so as prices were skyrocketing, what the regulators should have done is increased the down payments to 20% or 25% because it would have made it very difficult for people to buy houses. And it would have, would have slowed down the big uh, acceleration in, in values um, and, and you would have had a normal housing cycle. But what the government did was stoked up the cycle. It's like they threw kerosene on it because you had to put up almost nothing. So after everything collapsed, what did they do? They did the opposite. When houses collapsed 40%, they said, geez, why don't you put up 25% equity? Well, nobody had 25% equity when, when things were great. Who's going to have 25% equity to put up for a house? When the stock market collapsed, there was high unemployment, the economy was dead. The answer, nobody. So the government stopped the recovery. It's hard to imagine people do this, but it's very easy to see. I just described it to you. And I could understand perception's complicated, right? So they they want to say, okay, well, we made mistakes in the past. We're not going to make that mistake again. It, it seems to the public like they're doing the right thing, even if it's financially but the, the wrong the, thing. It's catastrophically wrong because you what you want to do is make housing available for people. That's when you want little equity and and you want to restart the economy. You want to give people a chance to have new homes and new construction and they'll have new jobs. So what they did is they did the exact reverse as regulators. So for us, we, we looked at that and said, oh my goodness, you know, pe people aren't going to be able to buy houses. People need houses. Houses are being repossessed. And we never repossessed a house. They were just being sold at auction. So we said, why don't we buy houses and we'll put money in them. We'll fix them up because a lot of these houses were half abandoned. We'll fix them up. We can provide jobs for the construction people and we'll rent them. Right, so you, you became, rather than taking advantage of a situation, which is again, public perception has two sides. You were the buyer of last resort. You yes. set the floor and that's when housing actually did start to rise. Housing prices rise once there was a buyer. Right. So we, we sort of knew when the bottom was because nobody was 
buying anything. And the government was choking credit off. And, and so all you had to do was buy them, if you had a lot of money, which we do, uh, and fix them and let regular people rent them. And they could be in a good school district. And what was wrong with that? Right. So, so you know, for people listening... That was, that was the dream. Right. And, and, and each time you sort of go to the place least crowded where nobody, everybody's running from there, you're walking in, and you're finding what you could do differently. You're finding where the opportunity is that people are missing, so you're risk averse. But if I'm sitting at home thinking, well, how can... How can I go to the place least crowded? How do I start exercising that muscle of finding out where there's a gap between reality and perception? Steve seems really good at it. How do I get good at that muscle? Well, it's, in, it's interesting. Usually uh, that happens uh, with information. Uh, it, it happens with your familiarity with the world you're, in, you're engaged with. Uh, and... If you look around, not everybody sees everything that they think is perfect. Um, that's that's not the way most people encounter the world. There's always something that can be done better or improved uh, or some other things that, that you think about that you could be good at. Uh, what do you like in life? Uh, what do you think you could do that you haven't tried? But it's, it's in your comfort zone. Um, uh, you know, it's it's always good to be doing something with somebody you know who knows something. Uh, the idea of just sailing out, uh, you know, into the Atlantic Ocean, hoping you were going to find America, not many people would do that, like Christopher Columbus, right? But if if you have somebody who's already made it to the New World, they've they they know how to navigate. You, you can get on that ship, and your chance of getting there is better. Right. You you describe with the savings and loans crisis. You didn't know anything about real estate, but you had someone on board who knew an enormous amount. And right. uh, Larry Fink, right, uh, uh, knew an enormous amount. And uh, you, a, a lot of it too is people don't know people. And you you describe in your I think it's rule number three in your rules of work and life. Write to people who you can learn from and try to meet them. Sometimes it's not that easy because. They're busy by definition. That's why you want to learn from them. How does the average person meet or learn, get, either get a mentor or virtual mentors or at least learn from someone who is fascinating to them? Well, you have to, you have to be looking. And these things don't hit you in the, in the face. Uh, so, so if you want to learn about something, uh, one thing I find about uh, Americans, which is much different than a lot of other places in the world, uh, Americans um, like like sharing. Uh, they like helping uh, people. There's a part of our personality that's like that. And everybody who's been successful has been helped by somebody. Nobody does this journey alone. That's like some novelist who doesn't understand how the world works, writes that kind of stuff. And real world, that doesn't happen. That lonely person wandering around discovering gold someplace uh, you, you really need the help of other people to to support you, uh, to instruct you, to introduce you to other people who might be good for you. So you have to recognize you're a bit you're going on a journey, and and you're looking for guides uh, and people who know more than you or know something different than you, and 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 you know you 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 talk to them. And, and you learn from them. And if you have some kind of drive or, or, or some kind of gift or some kind of curiosity uh, and you have a modicum of talent and somebody else sees that in you, they'll, they'll help you along. And part of what makes America a special place is, is that if, if you've done well as a result of that kind of personal, you know, sort of assistance, um, th then you have an obligation to help somebody else. Uh, you, people aren't islands. That, that's not the way people want to be. And my experience is, you know, there's always some nasty piece of work who tells you to get lost. But, you know, if, if you're really sincere and you need some help and, or you're looking for something or you're looking for information or, or relationships or something different, 
um, if, if you're communicative um, and you lay that out, uh, you'd be surprised people respond. Not 100% of the people, but way more people than you'd think. And that sets you off on well, a journey. How important is the aspect of when you're reaching out to that person you want to learn from, you bring with you something of value so that they, not that every engagement has to be transactional, not that every time you meet someone yeah. has to be transactional, but I'm assuming in many cases where you reached out to someone you were learning from, you are also offered something of value. Well, it's interesting. Um, one thing of value is, is, is flattery. Um, you know, people's self images are always unpredictable to the person who's, who's approaching them. Uh, and the fact that you're approaching them sometimes helps them self validate. Uh, the fact that you have, that you've thought about that person and there's something you do want to learn from them. There's some piece of advice you want. All, all you have to, to do is say, you know, I, I, in effect, I want to go on a journey. I, I want to change what I'm doing or I want to achieve something. Um, you know, you've done a bunch of that. How can, can you describe to me how you do that? What do you think next steps, you know, should be? And, and since everybody has a history, everybody, you know, has, is on a journey. Even if you see them as static, th they know they've been on a journey to get where they are. Uh, they, they, they usually will say, oh, that's interesting. What, what, what brings you here? Right, because you, in, in, in your last rule of work and life, I'll just read it. Um, it's very interesting to me. You say, number 25, everyone has dreams. Do what you can to help others achieve theirs. And that's related to this. It's not that, again, it's not transactional. It's not charitable. It's somewhere in between where if you want them to listen to you, if you want them to teach you, you also have to respect their dreams. Yes. Well, it, it is interesting that enabling someone to do something is, is, is very rewarding. Uh, it's, it's empowering. Uh, and you don't have to get anything from it other than the joy of affecting somebody else's life and, and taking away barriers so, so they can they can have their dream. They can be self-actualized. You've changed a life and it doesn't even cost anything. It just takes a little bit of time. And, um, it's a, a interesting. I, I got an email this morning, uh, uh from uh, a student, um, who had graduated from the Schwarzman scholars program, uh, which, uh, which I started in China for, to deal with us, China relationships and, and assembled a group of people like, uh, from the roads, uh, for graduate school and, and you know we got forty percent Americans and forty percent from the rest of the world and twenty percent Chinese. It's a fascinating, unique uh, program where they meet the leaders of the, the country and travel around and you know work in a you know in a Chinese uh, ministry or or not for profit or corporation. And you know it's about one hundred and forty, one hundred and fifty people a year. Uh, you know, truly extraordinary uh, uh, people. So this was one of those who graduated like two or three years ago and was telling me how her life was going because uh, I sent her a happy birthday thing. That, that's what so we do for all of our graduates. I like to send them a little happy birthday thing a on little the internet. Extra. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, keep in touch. And And she was saying, geez, you know, as a result of you providing the following base, Look! Look at the remarkable um, things that I'm doing now. This happened to be a remarkable person, and I, I, I said, I, "I just wanted to thank you for that." And I have a lot of things I do in a day, but sort of read that one, and I went, "How wonderful that we were able to to really change this person's life by providing." Any opportunity, guidance, uh, background, um, and, and and she will end up doing the same. Uh, and it's not like a do-gooders society. It's it's just what you do as a human 
to help other other people. So so it's interesting the way you describe that and the the joy you get, this feeling of I helped and that feels good. And you describe that almost that same feeling. I can imagine it's almost that same feeling D- during the financial crisis. Hank Paulson's uh, uh, undersecretary or assistant calls you and says, "Hey, Hank just wants you to know thanks for the guidance you gave him." And your f- for initial thought was, "I helped," and you right. felt good. Compare the two feelings, this morning's and that one. It's the same thing, uh, you know. It- you know, the financial crisis is different, right? You're protecting the system. You're protecting everyone's way of life. Uh, if if the, the government, Hank and Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner hadn't done the right things, and, and at that time, President Bush um, and the Congress, if they hadn't done the right things, we would have had a catastrophic collapse. Uh, and we weren't going to be getting out of that one. And what would have happened, by the way? I'm always curious about that. Well, I think you would have had, you know, like a collapse of the financial system. Uh, so let's say everyone goes to the ATM. There's no money there. It's, what do people do the next day? Well, the, the bank may not be there. So the bank government would have had taken over banks. Um, you know, you, you, you would have had, um, you know, sort of markets all uh, collapse. You would have had unemployment uh, at um, unimaginable uh, levels. Uh, You would have had um, negative economic growth uh, for quite some time, and you would have had to restart your economy. It it actually uh, wouldn't have been imaginable if this thing just all dropped uh, and, and we couldn't um, tape together uh, financial institutions um, the, as to what happened to Lehman. I mean, it just like disappeared. It stopped functioning. Everybody was unemployed. Uh, and um, so this was a very, very um, shockingly dangerous situation where most people wouldn't have understood that. But if you were raised as part of that part of the economy, you would know that. So so, so trying to help people because we're all like people. I mean, nobody ever been through this, uh, and it was alive, right? Uh, and and so you know, people in Hank's position and the other few people that I mentioned, they they had to get it right. Uh, and and so if you could help them think about things, you know, then then it's like your obligation, you know, to to help. I like how your your wife forced you to call Hank with with advice. She was like, "Call him." I, I never would have called. I figure he just knew everything. Huh. So you know, that's an that's an interesting thing that your assumption you never assume everybody knows everything. Anybody knows everything. But 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 I knew that what was going on was so profound that he would know the basic elements, which uh, which he did. I, I've talked to him subsequently a bunch, and he said, "Look, the things you were telling me." We, we, they, they were on our um, agenda, right? We, we knew all these ideas you were telling us, but they said, you, you gave us a, an insight, not just on those things, but on the timing. Do you think a financial crisis like that could happen again? I mean, obviously it can, theoretically, but do you think we, well, we've insulated in, ourselves? You know, in the short term, we've insulated ourselves uh, quite well in the United States. Um, we, we have really conservative uh, financial institutions now, uh, and uh, they've got loads and loads of capital, probably four times, uh, three to four times uh, what um, they had in the crisis. Lending standards are much more uh, conservative, and so we fought that war. We won it. Um, uh, but, but what happens in subsequent generations, people forget the lessons of that war, and that's why you have wars repeatedly in history. Somebody thinks they can win them. Uh, the risk we have, and this may be too technical for your audience, but um, the, the same way the regulators uh, messed up the housing recovery by doing just the opposite uh, as, as part of the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the Dodd-Frank uh, reforms, uh, they restricted uh, very substantially, 
the ability of the Federal Reserve, which is our central bank, to rescue the system. Th this was perhaps the most unwise set of laws that I've seen. The Dodd-Frank laws or? This part of the Dodd-Frank law, because they, they said, well, the Federal Reserve bailed out the system. We never want that to happen again. <laughs> the problem, that's like saying, oh, that doctor saved that patient. Uh, we never want that doctor to treat another patient. And it's funny because I don't think many people also realize the remedy was sort of outlined in Bernanke's PhD thesis from way back about how to solve the Great Depression. And he had a chance to actually yeah. put it into action and it worked. But, but the amazing thing is, in terms of bailing out the banking system, is actually sort of a misnomer, right? You, you, you gave them money and bought, in effect, stock in their company. And when they recovered, they gave you the money back with a profit. I don't know of a government program that's ever gotten money back with a profit. Government right. spends the money, it goes away. Here they made a profit, and, and it's got a bad name. So, so the idea that we've restricted the central bank from, from doing certain types of things to make sure that the financial system in a crisis is, is safe and sound is um, it's basically, I, I hate to say something like this because somebody might quote me, it's malpractice. Well, what do you think now with, um, you know, we've been deregulated, you know, Dodd-Frank, we're, we're, we're chipping away at it and, and the government has deregulated a lot of local, regional banks. Do you think that should spread to the more national banks? Like, do you think de there's too much now? It's too conservative? I, 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 don't, I don't know that it's too conservative. I, I think our system, as I said, is, is, is very well capitalized and, and, and well regulated uh, at, at this point. What I was talking about was infrastructure that they've changed um, because you always get an overreaction when you have a collapse. You get people say we need a lot of regulation and you do need more. The question is, is every piece of what you do right? And the answer typically is because people are working in a hurry and they don't have perspective and they want to get something done. There's some stuff that, that people put into things that is like, like will get you an opposite outcome and some things they are done that are right and sound. And, 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 you know, we need to fix the parts of this that, that don't work because we never want to expose uh, the system, uh, you know, in a way where, where doctors can't practice to save patients. So, you know, I want to I wanna go another 5,000 feet higher for a second. And just in terms of a thread I noticed throughout the book about your decision-making, Whenever you're confronted with a big deal, a big decision, you, you, you find your way to not squeeze out every dime, which you contrast yourself with. You're not looking for short-term, let's win every aspect of this negotiation. You find a way, though, bigger picture, bigger perception to get something more in every case. And, I, and I'm thinking specifically of a non-financial decision. When you were offered the chairmanship of the Kennedy Center, any human being would just say, yes, I'd be honored to. But you were like, yes, but I'm only going to do it if Carolyn Kennedy gets back involved. So it's, and we could talk about that specific situation, but it seems like in every situation you look for what is missing here that I that is open that I can get bigger in this decision. Well, I I like to be successful just like everybody else. So I, I like easy successes. Right? So so why make them hard? They're hard enough anyhow. Mm. So I always like to to figure out what does it take? And I guess that's why it's the name of the book. What, what does it take to make this situation into a winner? And in the Kennedy Center thing, because we had a big TV show and gave out the Kennedy Center Honors Awards every every year to like five uh, uh, remarkable humans. Um, I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, you know that that 
to make that show better and, and to unite uh, the community uh, in Washington, it was called the Kennedy Center. And the way it worked is, you know, uh, Ted Kennedy, Senator Kennedy took care of that and Carolyn uh, took care of uh, uh, the Kennedy Library up outside of Boston. And, you know, um, I, I figured if we could get the whole family behind the Kennedy Center and give it more of a shot in the arm uh, and try and change perception a little bit um, uh, and, and, and make it less Washington and, and more, you know, sort of, you know, New York, Boston, whatever. Um, you know, she, Carolyn was a symbol of the family and, and, you know, she didn't want to do it really because she had her own responsibilities. They divided that. And I, I said, that, that's, that's the killer app for this program uh it's a symbol uh unites the country um you know tells a story uh, makes makes everyone feel better and so that's why i said that's got to happen so it's almost like the, the lesson there is don't go for the easy yes and then try for change get get the change first so that the yes becomes easier. Right. You have to have, as I say, you need a vision of, of what you want uh, because you know that vision, if realized, will make things successful, make them work, make them grow, wonderful. And, and so you, you have to have that really before you start. And you have to assemble those pieces because once those pieces are there, you'll figure out how to shuffle those pieces but if the pieces aren't there, there's nothing to shuffle. Right? And you also have to have confidence to say no. So if someone's offered a job, typically they're like, oh, they want me? This is great. You have to always be able to say no and find that well, hidden perceptual thing that no one's asking for. Well, you, you also, I mean, I've been offered a number of really interesting things that I, I didn't think I was qualified for. Um, and, you know, some of them I was, I was offered to be the, head of a major securities firm at 34, I think. And, I mean, that was ridiculous. So, so I could have had the prestige of taking that job, and I would have failed. Why? Not because I'm a dummy. I just had no idea what I was doing at that age. You know, it, it, I, I couldn't handle that. And... You know, the people asking me said, oh, you're really terrific. You can handle that. I said, no, I, I can't handle that. I, I don't have the relevant experience. I need to be, you know, at least 10 years older uh, to have those, you know, aggregate experiences where I've learned things. I, I, you know, I'm not qualified. They said, well, please be the head of this. And I, I said, I'm not qualified. I'm turning this down. So, so it's not getting something it's it's knowing you can really do it and be you know hugely successful and we all know our capabilities and nobody wants to be in a situation they're not qualified for but, but i guess that's linked to um setting up a situation where you could say yes knowing you've got the cards you need to succeed like if you like maybe you could have said yes in that situation if they said look we're going to keep on you know, this board of advisors, they don't want to be CEO, but they'll, they're great. They'll all be in charge of their divisions. I, I always like to say, what's the best this can be? How do you, what's it going to look like? And, and then you just assemble the pieces. If you start out just sort of stumbling around in the dark, it's mm. really hard to find the bathroom. Mm. If, if you know where it is, or, or, or you left on that little mirror light, you know, where you put makeup, um, you'll always find the bathroom. Hmm. So it's, it's that simple. No, that's, that's a good quote. I'm going to remember that one. Uh, another thing I noticed as a thread throughout the book is there's this concept that when two people talk to each other, and this is really important in the investment business, but in any business, uh, that there's, they're telling each other the truth. If A talks to B, both sides assume without any reason to not assume that both sides are telling the truth. And everybody has a certain threshold by which after that threshold, they'll start to be suspicious. Below that threshold, 
They'll just assume the other person's telling the truth. And on average, people have a very high threshold. You seem to have a much lower threshold where if someone tells you or pitches you a deal, it's not, it's not that you're insane and thinking everyone's lying to you. You're not a conspiracy theorist, but you know, take, uh, 2006, 2005, going up into the real estate crisis. I noticed in your stories in the book, you had a very low threshold for when people would tell you what housing values were, even though the entire country was believing, including very famous hedge fund managers and investors were believing that housing prices were accurate. You had a very low threshold for believing someone was telling you something accurate. I, I always like to, um, be aware, and we teach that at the firm at, at Blackstone, um, what's going on in the whole world that's making everybody think what they think. In other words, what they think they believe is legitimate and true. Um, but sometimes, you know, they're, they're just being carried down a very rapid rapids. And, and what happens is when you're doing that, you know, these rocks are coming at you and so forth, and you, you have a sense of exhilaration, but, but you know, the whole world is in rapids, and then you get to the bottom, and then, you know, it's like a quiet pool, and you look at life differently. So in a way, um, just on, on a financial basis and uh, in economies and other parts, uh, you know, I found that, that life is cyclical. Things are cyclical. And you have to know where you are you know, so uh, when you were just mentioning housing and these people thinking that things could never end, that was a cycle that you could see building and it was right at the top. So everything they were all saying to each other, they believed to be true, but it, it, it wasn't. It was a bubble. And why was it a bubble? There was massive amounts of, uh, of, of, of money, very few restrictions. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry could buy something. Uh, and so that lasts for a while, and then it usually collapses. So it's it's not that you know I have a low threshold. Uh, I, I I just look at things for what they are, and and the people who are telling you something, they mostly believe it, but they may be wrong. But I guess it takes it's like exercising a muscle to be able to not follow the herd. I mean, the herd behavior bias is strong. Well, I'm not sure it's so much just a herd. Um, it's it's looking at everything in a um, an unemotional um, context and and always asking the question, what's happening here? Why is this person here? And why do they believe what they believe? And what's going on in this whole area that's that's bringing them here? So so for example. Um, I guess it was somewhere around late 2006, uh, w w within six weeks, uh, we got visits from three giant private companies that sold or suppliers to house building. Well, my family's had this company for three generations. We just want to sell it now. Hmm. Okay. Maybe it's an opportunity. By the time the second person comes in, well... My family's owned this thing for two generations, and we want to sell it now. And um, the third guy is maybe, I bought this company four years ago, and now I want to sell this company now. And you go, why are they all selling this company? These people must know something. It's like, we've never seen these people before. What's happening? And then you start looking, and you see the reason they're selling is they think the whole thing's so overheated. It doesn't matter whether it's three generations old or I just bought it last week. I just want to sell it, get the hell out of here. Okay? So they, they, they believe something that they didn't tell me, hmm. of course. And what happens is you look for patterns. And when you see three people in the same little industry all wanting to sell everything they own, that usually tells you you don't know the full story. So where do you see it? Do you see this happening in any pockets of the economy right now? Uh, consumer part of the economy is uh, really quite good. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. We, we, we have this um, uh, income issue. Uh, you know, they call it uh, income uh, 
uh, inequality, but but it's really um, more income and in, insufficiency. Uh, we have like the bottom forty percent of the country that isn't making uh, enough uh, income to lead a good life, and um, that drives our politics uh, to a significant degree. So, so one of the fixes is, is you have to get more money to those people. And there are a lot of different ways to do it. But one way it's happening is as the minimum wage starts going up, wages for that group are going up much faster than inflation. And, and so uh, um, you've got full employment, pretty much, but wages for the you know, sort of bottom 25 to 50% are going up much faster than they have for decades. Mm. Uh, and, and so, you know, that gives us um, a little bit of repair on the insufficiency problem, but it also gives us uh, a really good consumer economy. So, so kind of as a final question, you want to ask you a really dumb question? <laughs> There are no dumb questions. This one might be dumb. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, the president announced he would like to buy Greenland. You know, the Danish government said it's not for sale, but of course, everything has a price. There's a lot of people should research. There's a lot of good reasons why we should get Greenland. But why doesn't a why can't a private equity firm of your size actually? If, if if he could buy a country, why can't you buy a country? Because something like Greenland would be pretty valuable. I well, told you this was a dumb question. Well, we're not in the real estate development business. Uh, yeah, but there's all these rare earth mineral resources, uranium resources, and China's buying them all up. Uh, well, that, that, would, that would be a very inspired, out-of-the-box kind of uh, idea. Uh, I, I, I guess I haven't lived long enough to see a country sell itself. Um, you know... Sometimes it'll take money for, to give to give influence, but to actually stop being a sovereign, I I, I, I haven't seen that. So, yeah, no, but it was interesting. Just that I never thought about it either until he right. actually said it. <laughs> yeah, it was really uh, you know that was sort of an out of body uh, kind of idea. And then if you said, well, you know, think about the fascinating thing about the United States. Sort of, you know, wasn't the United States? There were a bunch of colonies basically on the East Coast. And the um, you know, United States was built through a series of uh, uh, acquisitions, uh, purchases of, of parts of the United States, the Louisiana Purchase being the best one for $4 million of, you know, dollar was worth much more uh, back then, but still world's greatest, world's greatest deal. You know, you bought like, what was it, two-thirds of the western United States on the you know, past the Mississippi River for $4 million. I don't care what the dollars were worth. And then there were some little fill-in pieces. Um, and, you know, that was pretty amazing. That was pretty amazing. So I, I'm not really qualified <laughs> to comment on, on buying, you know, another country. It's like an out-of-body uh, type of concept. But, but you know, having... Land generally, uh, you know, has proven to be a good thing because whether there are resources underneath them or other types of things, um, you know, uh, would be good. But I, I understand that people just sort of shook their heads, as did I. And then I started thinking about it, and I said, geez, if it doesn't cost much, you know, maybe that could be interesting. But, of course, in, in the real world, one, people don't want to do things like that for political reasons. But secondly, you know, um, um, what what would a price be? Uh, my instinct is not cheap. Um, might be worth it though. So <laughs> I leave that one to you. All right, I, I'll I'm going to start a fund to buy Greenland, and I'll pitch you for money. Uh, Stephen Schwartzman, I want to respect your time. Real, thank you so much for for coming up here again. CEO, chairman, co-founder of the largest private equity firm in the uh, the planet, Blackstone. Uh, so much success and so many lessons in your book. Uh, the book's called What It Takes, Lessons in the Pursuit of Excellence. As you can see, Stephen, I, I've got the whole thing like bookmarked, but I also just recommend people just check out your 25 rules for work and life. They are so incredibly valuable. 
that, and none of them has to do with investing. They're just good rules about success and finding opportunity and, and pursuing your, your dreams. Thanks so much for writing it. Thanks for so much for answering my questions and, uh, come on back again. I could go ask you five hours more questions, but I know you're, you're running the world. So I got to let you go. <laughs> I got to run. Thanks, Thanks so much. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Save here. Thank you. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.